ena iwi, ena mana, ena hoa mahi. Tēnā koutou katoa. E mihi ana ki a koutou, kua tai mai ki te tautoko tēnei kaupapa. Nā mihi nui ki a Professor Chad Siverson, te kai kōrero o te rā, te nā koe. Ko Dominic Stevens tōku ingoa, nō mai haere mai ki te tai ohanga. Welcome everybody to this instalment of the Treasury Guest Lecture Series, where we're honoured today to host Professor Chad Severson. I'm really looking forward to this talk and to the um, plenty of time for discussion uh, and questions afterwards. So this is the second edition of our, our new newly themed um, Treasury Guest Lecture Series, Productivity in a Changing World. Um, productivity in a Changing World is going to be the theme for, for perhaps just over a year from now. Um, the choice of this theme really recognises that productivity is absolutely crucial for living standards uh, um, uh, and living standards, incomes and well-being in New Zealand. But it, it also recognises that we live in a changing world. The climate is changing, geopolitics is changing and technology is changing. And we recognise that New Zealand is going to have to continue to adapt if we're to sustain living standards in this changing world. So um, I'm really looking forward to, um, yeah, we've got an excellent lineup of speakers over the year. Um, I'm really looking forward to the range of speakers that we've got and the discussion that we'll have over the year. But um, for today, uh, particularly excited to, to welcome Chad. Um, uh, he needs no introduction for those who work in the productivity space, but it's worth taking a moment just to acknowledge Chad's work and experience. Chad Severson is the George C. Tiao Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He's been on the University of Chicago faculty since 2001. Chad's research spans several topics with a particular focus on the interactions of firm structure, market structure and productivity. He's authored or co-authored dozens of scholarly articles and is the co-author of intermediate level textbook Microeconomics. Our guest is a former editor of the Journal of Political Economy, a research associate of the, of the National Bureau of Economic Research, and has served on multiple national academies committees and, and currently sits on the Census Scientific Advisory Committee. He teaches classes in competitive strategy and industrial organisation. So today, Chad's going to share his insights and reflections on the slowing productivity growth in the global economy. We'll also learn about Chad's findings around the patterns coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and what they mean for future growth. He's promised to give us some reasons for optimism about productivity prospects based on this um, economic research. So I'll hand over to Chad now, who I understand is going to present for around 45 minutes, um, and then we're going to have 40 minutes for questions and discussion. So we have a, um, a Q&A section um, if you can put your questions and discussion in there so that it, it sort of all comes up at the end um, and I'll be I'll be intermediating the the, the discussion um, uh, towards the end. Um, just keep the chat perhaps only for technical queries like I can't hear or anything like that. So we'll we'll, we'll do the, the Q and A actually through the Q and A function. OK, thanks, everybody. Um, over to you, Chad. Uh, and once again, welcome. Really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, that's a great introduction. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here uh, visiting with everyone uh, today, I, this morning to you. Um, let me just share my slides here and uh, we'll get started. Okay, I trust everyone can see uh, my uh, slides. If not, uh, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll just launch into uh, the talk. And again, it's, look, it's looking perfect, Chad. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I'll plan to go again, as Dominic said, about uh, 45 minutes, and then I'm um, happy to take uh, as many questions as we can fit in with the, the remaining time. All right. So first, what is productivity? Uh, it's how much output, uh, and output can be measured in a number of different ways. It could be measured in physical units of a, of a product, uh, quality adjusted units or a currency unit, like say dollars. Uh, it's how much output a producer obtains from each unit of input used to make that output. Okay? There are many different measures of productivity, varying outputs, varying inputs and so on and so forth. But in the end, they're all 
basically output to input ratios. Okay, so when you see productivity, you can read efficiency because it's basically a measure of the efficiency of production. Uh, and it can be, that can be efficiency at a very micro level, a given worker or uh, perhaps a production line or a factory, uh, but you can keep going up the aggregation ladder. You can also measure productivity at the company level, the uh, province level, the country level, and indeed even worldwide level. So uh, productivity researchers look at productivity at a number of different levels, and I'll be going back and forth between sort of the, the micro of productivity and the macro of productivity uh, throughout the talk today. But either way, whatever level you're looking at, it's again, some measure of the productive efficiency of some, some part of the supply side of the economy. Some common productivity measures you might be used to hearing about uh, would be uh, labor productivity is probably the most commonly used one. So that's output per unit labor input, which could be either per employee, so output per employee, or sometimes you'll see output per worker hour. Uh, either or, those are both measures of labor productivity because the only input used is uh, in the denominator is, is labor. There's also a measure of total factor productivity, which tries to combine all the inputs that are used by the producers into a single denominator. Uh, there's some function that combines, say, labor, capital, intermediate inputs, uh, and puts it all together. That function is something for PhDs to worry about, but again, you could just basically think of it as uh, uh, um, an economically, uh, uh, an economic theory guided way to combine different inputs together into a single measure of input. And when you do that, that's called total factor productivity, or sometimes people call that multi-factor productivity. Okay. Why does productivity matter? Well, Dominic already hinted at that. Uh, at the macro level, Productivity is the speed limit on economic growth. Indeed, the only way a country can uh, sustain, uh, obtain sustain, sustained economic growth in GDP per capita, that is, and other measures of material li uh, living standards is through productivity growth. If you don't have productivity growth, you will not be able to get continued increases in material living standards. Uh, it matters quantitatively too. Uh, it's about one for one. So if you have a sustained, say, 1% per year drop in productivity growth, you can expect a sustained 1% per year drop in GDP per capita. 2% okay? uh, would be 2% and so on and so forth. So it's it really is the speed limit on economic growth per capita. Uh, and even small changes. Now, now you might say, well, 1%, what's 1%? Well, 1% for one year is something. I'll show you what that is in a second. But if you have a sustained period, a decade or two decades worth of a slowdown in productivity growth of, say, 1%, then it really starts to add up as the compounding kicks in. So that's the why productivity matters at the macro level. Why does it matter at the micro level? Well, it's one of the main predictors of the success or failure of a business. So we know from... Uh, at this point, hundreds of studies, if not thousands, that uh, high productivity companies are one, more profitable, two, more likely to stay in business and grow uh, to become larger, and three, also they pay high, tend to pay higher wages and charge lower quality adjusted prices. So higher productivity is good for businesses and it tends to be good for businesses, workers, as well as businesses, customers as well, because efficiency create, in some sense makes the pie bigger uh, and that could be split up amongst all participants in the market. So the issue that uh, we've been dealing with, we productivity researchers and practitioners who worry about productivity uh, and economic, its relationship to economic policy, uh, what's been going on for the past uh, 15 years or so now is that there's been a slowdown in productivity growth. Uh, these series show for various uh, economies and levels of aggregation, uh, average productivity growth rates uh, over the past uh, 50 years. This is from the Conference Board Total Economy Database. And you can see, uh, if you look at, say, the blue solid line there, that's world total productivity. So that's, again, the total output of all economies in the world divided by the total inputs of all economies in the world. Uh, and that 
uh, measure productive efficiency, it's always been growing. Note that the numbers here for the world are always positive. So productivity is going up every year, but the rate at which it's been, uh, has been going up has been changing. And in particular, you can see that that rate of growth has been slowing since about the mid 2000s. Okay? Uh, that is true worldwide. It's also true for specific clumps of economies. If you look at emerging and developing economies, that's the orange dash dot line there. You can see the uh, volatility of the growth rate is larger, but it's the same sort of pattern. The slowdown starts in the mid 2000s. The US has uh, experienced its own productivity slowdown started a few years earlier. Other mature economies, same uh, pattern uh, basically as the US. Okay, so we've had now again, we're about 15 years into a worldwide productivity slowdown. If you look at the world average, it's fallen from a little over 2% per year productivity growth down to about 1% per year. So that's what I'm talking about. A 1% per year, a 1% drop in productivity growth for a year is one thing, but you sustain that over a decade or two, it really starts adding up. Uh, to give you a, a sense of what I'm talking about, for the world, an extra 1% productivity boost uh, right now, so that is just for one year, is worth about 1.65 trillion New Zealand dollars. So that's $200 per uh, capita for everyone in the world. Okay, That would alleviate a lot of poverty if that were spread evenly over the world, $200 uh, uh, for each person. From Uh, if New Zealand itself experienced a 1% productivity growth burst this year, that would be worth about $730 for every New Zealander. And that's so that we're talking real money for one year, again, but you compound that over 10 or 15 years, uh, and now people are significantly less material, materially well off than they would be otherwise. Right? So. I hope this makes clear that productivity growth makes everything easier. It's uh, basically, it changes the world from one where there's inherent trade-offs. We can have more of this, but we have to have less of that and fight or vice versa to one where there don't have to be trade-offs. It's better to loosen the constraint than to try to do better within this constraint. When you have productivity growth, it's not this or that. You can have more of both this and that. All right, so how has New Zealand been doing within this context of this worldwide productivity slowdown? Well, it too suffered uh, a slowdown. So if you look at, say, the 1995 to 2004 period before the slowdown started, New Zealand was averaging 1.2% per year labor productivity growth. That is the output per worker hour in New Zealand was growing by about 1.2% per year. Note that that was smaller than the G7, smaller than the EU, smaller than the US over that period. So New Zealand was already uh, experiencing slower productivity growth than most of the mature economies were in the late 90s, early 2000s. Then when the productivity slowdown hit, uh, it also hit New Zealand. Now, didn't uh, decrease New Zealand's productivity growth rates as much as it did some of the faster uh, growing eco uh, economic areas I just mentioned. You can see basically New Zealand's been close to parity with the G7, the US and the EU uh, since 2000, since the slowdown started. But the slowdown again ha did occur in New Zealand. Uh, in just the past three years, there's been a little bit of sign uh, that the US has had might have emerged, although uh, the last few quarters, which aren't included in, in the figures here, haven't been so encouraging. Um, and there's a little bit of that movement in New Zealand too, but again, we're not, we're not back to the uh, uh, worldwide, we're not back to the levels that we were seeing uh, before the mid 2000s slowdown. And uh, I'll be talking about what we can expect over the coming five to 10 years uh, a little bit later. Uh, because New Zealand uh, has uh, sort of experienced the same sort of qualitative and to some extent quantitative pattern of productivity growth uh, as the U.S. and other mature economies, what this means is while productivity has been increasing in New Zealand, it hasn't been increasing any faster over the past half century, say, uh, 
uh, than sort of the world frontier. So for example, if you compare output per hour in New Zealand to output per hour in the US in the same year, and you do that over the past 50 years, you get the figure you see here. So in the early 1970s, the typical New Zealand worker was producing an output per hour in the neighborhood of about two thirds of what the average US worker was doing. And basically that's about the same as it is now. In fact, it's a tiny bit lower. So what we haven't seen is a pattern of convergence of New Zealand towards the frontier. We'd like to see that, and you might think you could see that if sort of best practices can diffuse uh, throughout the world economy, but we can see with 50 years of history that process hasn't uh, really taken hold in New Zealand. So uh, while New Zealand has had productivity growth, it hasn't been any faster than the world frontier. And so, again, as a fraction of, of say, U.S. productivity, uh, we haven't seen any real uh, uh, movement on that dimension. So how, how do we want to think about this data I've shown you? To be honest, these patterns aren't particularly encouraging. There's a worldwide productivity slowdown, New Zealand suffering from it too. Even before the slowdown, there was no sign that New Zealand was converging to the world frontier. So is there something that one might think would create would uh, suggest some logical steps to go forward to try to kickstart some convergence, turn around the slowdown, and 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 sort of uh, break the pattern that we've been seeing? So the way I'm going to talk through that issue is I'm going to talk about what do we know as researchers about what things do affect productivity and by putting those things in front of us, maybe we can we can visit during the Q&A about uh, more specific issues that might try to affect those, those things. So what I'm going to start through now are, is just talking about what economic research has shown uh, are the things that, that influence productivity. And I'm going to start with a focus on what influences productivity for specific businesses, that is companies or producers, uh, but I'll also talk about how that then implies uh, productivity growth at a more aggregate level, the market, the industry. Uh, you might put into two large bundles. Uh, one are things that at least in concept, uh, businesses have some control over. I, I call them the levers for short, because these are things again, that you might expect a company would be able to to tug on if they're trying to, to affect their productivity level. The second set of factors are aspects of the operating environment, the, the external factors. These aren't things that any given producer in a market might have a, a, a direct influence on, yet nevertheless will affect the productivity of producers in that market, uh, both individually and as a unit, as a whole. So uh, there are many different levers. Um, a categorization that I, I've tended to use as this six uh, uh, category uh, uh, list you see right here. Uh, these levers include uh, managerial practices or managerial talent, uh, higher quality labor and capital, that is to uh, have um, uh, workers that are better trained, better educated, uh, better able to work together, et cetera or capital, that is machinery, structures, intangibles, uh, intellectual property uh, type capital uh, that's of higher quality. Okay? Uh, third, IT and R&D, you might even call number three like two in a, two a because uh, IT is a kind of capital and R&D creates knowledge capital, which is intangible, but nevertheless is a kind of capital. Uh, fourth is learning by doing. Learning by doing is the process of uh, becoming more efficient through the actual process of operating. It's sort of, um, it's it's more directed than raw training. Deliberate about um, creating a feedback loop between what it's learning from the production process uh, and then how it tries to change the production process to increase productivity in response to what it's learned. Uh, fifth is product innovation, that is to make changes uh, 
not in the process side so much, but more on the product side to change products to make them uh, better uh, able to satisfy consumers' uh, preferences. And then sixth are, are firm company or company structure decisions. That is uh, issues of say vertical integration. Uh, do you wanna own your supplier or not? Or horizontal expansion as well. Which various markets does a given company wanna operate in? Does it wanna be narrowly focused or more broadly uh, focused instead? Okay. So various uh, uh, studies have found for each of these things here, and there's multiple studies for each of them, um, that uh, uh, these things when applied judiciously can improve uh, productivity for a given producer. Okay? Now it's not that easy, otherwise presumably a bunch of producers would be doing this and we wouldn't have uh, um, such an issue with productivity growth. So not to say it's easy, but we know that they, at least in principle, these things can affect uh, individual producers' productivity levels. Um, I'm going to just, you know, there's we could spend <laughs> well more than 45 minutes on, on the, each one of those. I'm just going to very briefly go into a little more depth on one of them, and that is managerial practices and talent. This is something that I think folks have speculated about a long time as affecting productivity, um, yet there wasn't a lot of systematic evidence on that until about uh, 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, since then, there's been a set of concerted efforts to try to collect data on managerial practices related to productivity, see if it's not just correlated, but also causal. One of the best known and earliest examples of this is the World Management Survey, uh, which was put together uh, by doing detailed discussions with plant managers from uh, companies around the world, tens of thousands of companies now in dozens of countries, uh, codified those um, interviews into management practice scores and showed uh, basically that higher uh, scores in this management practice uh, um, uh, evaluation were indeed correlated with productivity, but more than that actually uh, seemed to be causal as well. If you went in and, and uh, manipulated the practices a given company did uh, experimentally, you would actually find that productivity went out, went up. So we've learned a lot from this, but of course there's much further to go. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that this is one of the areas, one of the levers that we know a lot about and know how it can affect and improve productivity. So uh, having said that, you might say, okay, well, where is New Zealand in terms of its average management quality? I'll show you uh, data from the World Management Survey aggregated to the country level. Uh, remember they're interviewing hundreds of companies uh, in many different um, thousands of companies in many different countries. If you then take the average management practice score uh, for each country, and then you uh, list those countries from highest average to lowest average uh, management practice score, you get the figure I've shown you here. You can see that the top five are, uh, in terms of management practices are the US, Japan, Germany, Sweden, and Canada. Uh, and New Zealand ends up uh, a, more towards the middle of the pack. I should have counted before, but it looks like it's maybe number 12 or 13, uh, somewhere between Singapore and uh, Northern Ireland, which was uh, separately tabulated from Britain. So uh, that gives, gives you a sense of your neighbors in terms of management practice area. There's a, quite a bit of gap between New Zealand and say the top five uh, New Zealand, on the other hand, is well ahead of a number of other uh, countries, but it gives you, I think, a sense that at least there seems to be some scope for improvement in terms of managerial practices in New Zealand. Uh, and these are averages across, again, a number of different companies, of 150 specifically uh, for New Zealand in this study. Um, so it's not that as if every uh, 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 New Zealand company is is lagging behind uh, its uh, competitors and other in more in the say top five countries, but it does mean on average that the that there is a, a gap. And you might expect that if you could close that gap, uh, some of the productivity uh, convergence that I mentioned wasn't happening might might start. Okay, so that's the very quickly about the levers. Now, what what about these external factors, the things that companies don't have direct control over, yet nevertheless might affect their productivity? 
Um, I prefer a categorization that includes four of these external factors. One are productivity spillovers. This is where um, the efficiency of one company somehow flows from that company into related companies. Related companies could be competitors. It could be uh, companies operating in different market, uh, in different product markets, but a similar geographic market or some other mechanism. There are, and speaking of mechanisms, there are a number of ways these spillovers can happen. They can happen by workers moving from the more productive to the less productive company. It can happen through industry associations, et cetera. Those are uh, productivity spillovers. Competition is, of course, a big one. That's uh, one thing I've spent a lot of my research time studying is how competition affects productivity. And it can improve productivity both through intra-market, intra-country competition, as well as trade competition. International uh, trade pressure can also uh, induce um, productivity gains through competition. I'll give you a little more detail on the mechanics of that in a second. Uh, the regulatory environment can affect uh, productivity as well, as well as input market flexibility. That's basically saying, how well does an economy move inputs like workers and capital around? You can have fantastic, uh, very competitive product markets, but if workers can't move from one company to another, say, or the finance sector can't move uh, capital from one company to another, uh, it, that competition isn't going to matter much because competition should make the more productive companies larger. But if they can't get any larger because they can't hire the workers they need or get the capital they need to expand, then um, that's going to be a problem. So in that sense, competition and input market flexibilities are, are sort of complementary to one another. All right. So these things, again, they don't directly affect uh, or, or companies can't directly uh, affect them, but they do influence the, the company's um, uh, productivity through two mechanisms, by the way. One is through giving, so let's say through competition, giving companies an incentive to improve their productivity. If a new competitor comes into your market and you're inefficient, well, you better get more efficient or you might be run out of business. So you've got more incentive to become uh, um to raise your productivity level, perhaps through pulling the, one of the levers, one or more of the levers I mentioned before. Uh, but also uh, these things affect uh, which companies grow and survive. So if a company doesn't respond to a new competitor and is less efficient, it would in the long run, we might will shrink. We know that from the from research and it's also more likely to go out of business. And if it does, that's not great for the company. But if you think about what's happened to average productivity in that market, it's gone up because that formerly inefficient company's activity has been replaced by a more efficient competitor. So we can actually kind of characterize these different mechanisms of how the micro level, the company level productivity variations add up to the macro uh, uh, level, uh, the aggregate level productivity. Uh, growth numbers that I was showing you earlier. Okay, so there, there are different ways that can happen. One is where companies in an industry or in an economy raise their own productivity levels. That would say in response to the, the incentives I just mentioned. This is sometimes called within growth. That is with growth within of productivity within a given producer. Or it could be through economic activity being systematically shifted towards higher productivity companies. The market steers more activity towards the more efficient. That's sometimes called between growth. That would be the example I gave you where the company doesn't respond to the competitor, it just gets run out of business. And then there's the new more efficient companies entering the market, replacing the less efficient uh, efficient ones that go out of business. So that's sometimes called net, net entry growth. That's really a special category of between, between growth. Um, all of these can be uh, driven by any of the mechanisms I already described, and they can be affected by many different policies as well. Okay? I've got some uh, mathematical examples of how uh, these micro effects add up to average productivity growth. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into them in detail, but these slides will be made uh, available after my talk, and you can take a closer look at them. They're just examples of the three types of, of productivity growth I already mentioned. Okay, so let me uh, focus a little uh, bit more on um, this sort of between mechanism, this 
resource reallocation within industry. So this notion that the market will steer more activity towards more efficient producers. Okay. All right, so what do we know about differences in productivity and how markets react to that uh, uh, over time? Well, one fact is, and this has been shown in uh, hundreds of industries, time periods and countries, it's just a ubiquitous fact uh, that in basically any market you look at, there's gonna be enormous dispersion in productivity amongst the businesses that operate in that market, even within a, what you might think are quite narrowly defined markets. Okay? Uh, for example, it is typical, not unusual, it is typical to find a business that is getting twice as much output from the same inputs as another business operating in that same market in that same time period. Okay? So I give these two businesses the same number of workers, the same amount of capitals at buildings and machinery, and then the same amount of intermediate materials, energy, et cetera. One of those producers will get twice as much stuff to sell out of those same inputs as the other. That is the typical situation within a market. Again, that's not the unusual status. That is most markets have that size gap. Okay? So that's one fact. Second fact. There is enormous churn within industries. What do I mean by that? That one way to think about it is gross flows are in order of magnitude larger than net flows. So for example, uh, in the US uh, every month at the, uh, the first Friday of every month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports how many jobs net have been created over the last month. Okay? A typical number would be 200,000. So we'll see a growth in the US of 200,000 jobs over the course of the month. That is a net change. Okay? That 200,000 actually hides enormous gross changes. So what you actually see if you just count up the number of jobs created, as well as the number of jobs destroyed, that 200,000 net gain is really, on average, 6.1 million jobs created every month and 5.9 million jobs created destroyed every month. Okay, so that net gain of 200,000, quite modest, is actually hiding uh, uh, gross flows that are an order of magnitude larger. Now that's for labor, but you see this for inputs and outputs all together. Just the amount of reshuffling of, uh, of uh, uh, inputs and outputs in a market is is huge. So you always have this churning process, even if it looks like the surface of the market's kind of calm, there's a whole lot of churn going on underneath. Okay, so that's the second fact. The interesting thing happens when you put the first fact with the second fact. When you have very dispersed productivities and a lot of churn, what you typically see, and this is again something you see across industries, time periods, and countries, is that this churn tends to steer more activity towards the more efficient businesses. High productivity businesses more likely to grow, low productivity businesses more likely to shrink and exit. And so you get through this reallocation process, this between growth that I mentioned earlier, and that will give you growth and productivity for the market or the industry or the economy as a whole, even if no individual business itself becomes more productive. When you then add the business within growth to it, you get still more productivity growth. Okay, so that's this resource reallocation. Now, a lot of the rest of the talk is going to deal with this. That's why I wanted to, to lay it out very, um, very carefully. This became an issue when folks were uh, talking about uh, policies instituted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay? Uh, in particular, there was concern, of course, that there was going to be a large slowdown in, in economic activity. Uh, moreover, uh, there were a lot of policies instituted that basically um, were to limit the churning process. Okay? There were a lot of, uh, dependent on the country, there was either job protection or work pro worker protection, uh, um, uh, policies that would uh, uh, basically pay companies to not dismiss their workers. Uh, 
There were uh, payments to companies for other reasons to keep them from going bankrupt, et cetera, et cetera. And there was some notion that while it made plenty of sense to save people's jobs, get people cash, don't have a bunch of bankrupt businesses uh, 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 flooding the market at the same time because of this uh, pandemic, while that made sense, it might have uh, negative effects on productivity because it would slow down this churning process. So there was a lot of concern uh, at the beginning of the pandemic that these policies, while having direct beneficial effects, might have uh, knock-on productivity effects that would be uh, costly later. Um, it turns out uh, that uh, the best data we have to this point suggests no, and I'll show you a little bit of that. We don't have a so-called zombie firm apocalypse. There aren't a lot of companies that should have gone bankrupt that didn't and are only going or only staying uh, alive simply because um, taxpayers keep subsidizing their activity or something like that. The, the link between churn and average productivity growth that I mentioned on the last slide seems to have stayed intact. All right, so I started off with the world as it is, which frankly, in productivity terms, isn't so great. Uh, but I'd like to push a little bit as we as we conclude or come towards a conclusion here on an optimistic case for productivity. Okay, uh, I'm not just going to tell stories. I'm going to tell stories with data. This is a data driven optimistic case. I'm going to show you what's going on and why one could interpret that as being signs of, of perhaps a reversal of the productivity slowdown. To be clear, though, this is a case, not a prediction. I'm giving you the good side. Someone so inclined could probably look at some other data that might be less optimistic, put that on the other side of the balance. I'm not sure where we're going to end up on net, but um, I'm going to give you the, the optimistic case because the, there really are changes that I think are encouraging and, and worth talking about, thinking about as we, we go forward. Okay, so if you look at what's been going on in the US with average productivity, what you actually see is there was a big uh, acceleration in productivity uh, towards the beginning of the uh, um, pandemic, in part because this churn process wasn't damaged uh, too significantly, and also uh, simply because um, output went down a lot, but workers' hours went down even more. A lot of people were sent home or chose to stay home. Uh, nevertheless, a reasonable amount of output were made. That seems to be a very temporary thing. The last year or so of productivity growth has sort of brought us back. In fact, it brought us back a little bit below the trend we were on before uh, the pandemic started. So we've basically gone through a lot of volatility, but have ended up back where we might have expected to be had the pandemic never happened at all. So just in terms of the aggregate numbers, there's no obvious change in what's going on. However, if you dig into the details, you see something interesting. And here are some of those stats. So I mentioned this churn process. This churn process is sometimes uh, shorthanded as dynamism in an economy. It's the ability of the economy, again, to be moving things around in response to differences in productivity. It turns out that before the pandemic, uh, measures of dynamism in the U.S. And, and broadly in many advanced economies had been experiencing long-term declines. So as large as, say, those labor flows that I was mentioning were, <coughs> pardon me, it used to be that they were larger still. So if you just look at churn rates along a number of different dimensions, they had been falling for a few decades uh, before the pandemic. I've given you some numbers just for the five years prior, so you have some sense of where they are. But those are what numbers had obtained after slowing down for quite a while. If you went back to, say, uh, the 80s or 90s, these uh, um, uh, dynamic uh, dynamism uh, metrics would be even higher. Um, so you've come, you're going into the, the uh, uh, pandemic with this downward trend in dynamism, which is, of course, worrying because if this churn process is increasing productivity, if the process is slowing down, the productivity growth that comes from it slows down. Well, what we have seen coming out of the pandemic is that these measures of churn have actually turned around. 
They're higher than they were in the five years prior to the pandemic. As you can see, I've got uh, uh, the uh, hires and separation rates, which I already mentioned for the US. You see this in job to job flow rates in the UK, and you see it in New Zealand in terms of business formations. All of these things are up uh, above where they were pre pandemic. They haven't by any means reversed the decades long slowdown, but it's really been the first movement in the other direction we've been seeing in a long time. Now, the issue is, of course, will this be sustained or not? And I can't answer that for you. But again, this is the first turnaround of any note uh, in a long time. So I find these uh, encouraging. Here's just some examples of what you see, say layoffs and quits in the US economy. Um, why is this a useful measure of churn? Well, layoffs and quits are both ways that people leave jobs. Typically what you see is that uh, um, during recessions, during downturns in economic activity, uh, layoffs are higher than quits. And you saw that you see that during the, the Great Recession there, 2008, nine, you can see that uh, layoffs were higher than quits. Uh, that hasn't been the case except for a very couple months at the at the very start of the pandemic. And indeed, what's been going on is the opposite. The quit to layoff ratio is as high as, as it's ever been. I find this encouraging because quits are voluntary departures from a job. Layoffs are involuntary departures. So it means workers are choosing to leave their job. They are not by and large, going into unemployment or out of the labor force, they're going and taking other jobs after they quit. If they're taking other jobs voluntarily, that must mean the job that they took was better than the one that they quit. Uh, and what do we know? Wages are correlated with liking a job. Productivity is correlated with wages. So I read a high quit to layoff ratio suggesting workers are moving to higher productivity jobs at a rate faster than they ever have before. I've developed some evidence that this is, happens uh, in Chile with some co-authors, uh, and I'm interested in following up with this in the US, but at least in terms of the directionality, uh, I find this encouraging that workers are moving into jobs where they're more productive, which should raise average productivity levels for everyone. Here's the job to job flow rate in the UK. You can see a big increase uh, after the start of the pandemic. Here is the relationship between um, uh, 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 size growth and productivity, whether you measure it in labor productivity, per, uh, labor productivity or total factor productivity. This is UK data, by the way, from work that Nick Bloom and some co-authors had done. You see this relationship here between uh, uh, productivity and grow. So what, what it implies is the more productive firms are the ones that are growing faster. Okay. So in other words, even during this, this is during the height of the pandemic. Now average growth, growth is actually negative here, but the more productive firms are, I guess, was shrinking less quickly. So the directionality is the way uh, you would want it to go, not in the sort of zombie firms direction that I think a lot of people were worried about. One of the starkest patterns we've seen, at least in the U.S., in terms of dynamism, is that job, uh, or not job, sorry, business formations are way up. So business formations were basically level at about 300,000 per month um, for years before the pandemic. They spiked during the pandemic, and they stayed high since then. They're now at about one third higher than they were before the pandemic, even you know a year and a half out from any sort of um, rele uh, 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 release of uh, 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 lockdown and, and things like that. And it's not just people desperate for something to do, starting a company in their garage. If you look at what are called high employment propensity businesses, these are businesses that start with a set of characteristics that we know uh, from past work are associated with growth and hiring in the future. Those are also up about a third. So they went from about 100,000 per month to somewhere in the neighborhood of 130, 140,000 per month. And again, they have stayed high uh, since that time. So these are just uh, 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 encouraging patterns cumulatively relative to trend. That means in the US now we have about 4 million more businesses than we would have had otherwise, and 1 million more high employment propensity businesses than we would have had otherwise. So it's really, it really adds up and, and I think bodes well for future productivity growth.
You see the same thing in the EU. This shows uh, uh, registrations versus declarations of bankruptcies. There was a bit of a spike in the last two quarters of 2022 in the EU for bankruptcies, but until then, there had been growth in formations relative to uh, bankruptcies. All right, so I'm going to finish up with one more optimistic note, uh, and it's built around a concept that uh, Eric Brynjols and Daniel Rock and I uh, have written about called the productivity J-curve. And the notion of the productivity J-curve uh, comes from thinking about a world where intangible capital matters a lot. Intangible capital is it's capital, but it's not measured as such. This is like uh, know-how, um, uh, organizational capital, uh, the esprit de corps among workers, brand, um, uh, relationships with suppliers and uh, uh, distributors, all those sorts of things that we know matter to businesses, uh, but aren't uh, capitalized on a balance sheet the way, say, buildings or machinery are. Okay? So if you think about how the problem with intangible capital in terms of measurement, of course, is that it's intangible. We don't measure it. So if we think about how pro, uh, intangible capital affects productivity measures, um, we can come up with a couple uh, insights. One, and this is the one I think more people go to first, is that, oh, okay, well, capital is an input. And if there's this input I'm not measuring, uh, when I look at the output to input ratio, productivity, in some sense, input's too small. So therefore, intangibles make one understate true, or sorry, overstate true productivity growth. That is, the output that's being created by intangibles is attributed to productivity when it's really just the product of intangible capital. And that's true. That's perfectly logical. Uh, but what's often forgotten is that when intangible capital is made, it's actually an output. We count any capital that tangible capital, that is buildings, machinery, et cetera, that's, a, that's an output when it's made. So if you're making as an economy, a bunch of intangible capital, uh, but you're not measuring it, you're understating productivity because output is being understated. So there's a mismeasurement problem that intangible capital creates both in the denominator and the numerator of productivity. And so whether you're overstating or understating productivity depends on the relative overstatement or understatement uh, of output versus inputs. Okay, so that's the basic idea of how intangibles affect productivity measurement. Now let's combine that with a notion of what happens when there's a new broadly applicable technology, uh, which an economist called general purpose technologies. These are technologies that can be used in all sorts of applications. Electricity is an example of a uh, general purpose technology or electricity and steam power, if you'd rather. Uh, in, uh, information technology is a kind of general purpose technology. They have a lot of different applications in a lot of different sectors. Yeah. Well, if you've got a new general purpose technology that involves making a lot of intangible investments along with it, and just to be concrete, let's think about what might be the next general purpose technology, artificial intelligence. If you think about businesses which are now scrambling to try to figure out how to use artificial intelligence and what they do, they have to make a lot of intangible investments. They have to retrain workers. They have to perhaps change their organizational form. They have to uh, update software. They have to perhaps uh, done in-house, they have to do a number of different things to reconfigure the way they do business in order to incorporate this new kind of, of capital. So if you then say, well, how does that process of creating all these intangible capital in response to the new general purpose technology, how does it affect this productivity mismeasurement, which I just mentioned? Well, what happens is you have to make this intangible capital before you use it. So the, while in principle, you could either understate or overstate productivity uh, because of intangible capital, there tends to be a particular time pattern to the overstatement and understatement. And that is when you're first building this intangible capital, you're making all this output that's not being counted. So you're understating productivity initially. Later, when that intangible capital 
is put into place and is being used to produce stuff, then you're undercounting inputs and you're overstating productivity. So if you look at the path of true productivity, which might say look something like this, it's just going up. The J curve says, well, measured productivity, first you understate productivity, and then later you overstate it. So you get this J shape, um, hence the name. Okay? So the assertion here is that general purpose technologies create this J curve phenomenon in measured productivity. Okay? And we actually, uh, uh, here's a stylized picture of what the J might look like. The important thing to recognize is there's this period where you're understate how much how high productivity is can last a long time with a simple you know just putting some back of the envelope numbers on things here you can see this understatement in our our simple example lasted 15 years so you had a decade and a half of understated productivity basically because during this whole period in response to a new general purpose technology businesses are spending all these resources getting ready for it in other words making intangible inputs but are intangible capital, but they're not getting any measurable output from it. Okay. But again, if you were measuring things correctly, you should be measuring that intangible as well. So you're, you're understating true productivity growth. We actually went, grab some numbers for what happened with uh, computer hardware intangibles, for example. And we found that there was a J curve associated with that. Obviously the true data is a little messier than the stylized back of the envelope model in this figure. But you can see the bottom half of the J curve shape and it lasts from about mid 1990s to the mid 2010s. So you're about a 20 year understatement of productivity growth due to IT hardware. Okay? So maybe AI is the next thing. And maybe we've already started on the bottom end of the J curve related to AI. Okay? Is it possible? Well, if you run some back of the envelope calculations, it would say in 2022, for example, it's not implausible that in the US, there were perhaps $200 billion of intangible investments made in response to AI. Okay? $200 billion is about eight tenths of a percent of GDP that year. Okay? So if that's right, we are undercounting GDP and therefore undercounting productivity uh, by about 0.8%. To give you an idea of how large that is, that was the average yearly slowdown in GDP growth uh, during the, in the pre-productivity uh, slowdown period and the post-productivity slowdown period. In other words, we would reverse one year's worth of lost GDP from the productivity slowdown if we were indeed mismeasuring uh, efforts to prepare for AI uh, along these lines. Okay. Now, there'll be overstatement of productivity later. In some sense, we're just moving the mismeasurement from, from one point to another. But what the, the bottom line of this is that we could be actually getting ready for AI at a, a, a good clip, yet it won't show up in the productivity statistics for, for several years. Now, do I think that's that is what's caused the productivity slowdown? No. So if you do this back of the envelope calculation, even just five years ago, I, AI uh, investments were too small uh, to have any aggregate effect. And we actually run through some calculations in the paper that also suggests other uh, general purpose technologies uh, weren't responsible, were responsible for the productivity slowdown. So we don't think that's a measurement issue, but as we think about productivity growth going forward, it's quite possible that AI could be be putting uh, being put into place in a number of different um, sectors and applications. Yet it won't show up in productivity growth for several years uh, after that. So uh, that's a sort of a it's an optimistic note about true productivity growth, but a bit of a pessimistic note about measured productivity growth growing forward. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, productivity is hugely important. Uh, for determining increases in economic well-being. It is, like I said, the speed limit on economic growth. Uh, we are in a slowdown of that speed limit. Worldwide productivity growth has been slow uh, for the past 15 to 20 years. New, New Zealand's, unfortunately, no exception to that. Uh, research does offer insights as to what influences might recharge productivity gains, both within individual producers and across them, that is 
uh, across uh, producers in a given market or economy. And there are some optimistic signs of future productivity performance. But of course, these are uh, uh, this is a case, not a prediction. All right, thanks very much. I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thanks very much, Chad. That was um, absolutely excellent presentation. Um, we have had lots of um, uh, activity on the Q&A function, so thanks very much everybody who's added their questions. Um, what I've been doing in the last you know, couple of minutes as you spoke is trying to aggregate some of these questions because um, some of them are on, on similar themes. So we've got, I think that's, that's the way I'll do it. I'll go through, um, there's a couple on measurement, which is what you've finished on there, so perhaps we'll continue that. There's a couple on productivity and sustainability um, you've used there. A little bit on the economic cycle. Um, and how that's influencing measures of productivity. And um, I've got a question on active labour market policies at the moment. So, so that's the first five. Um, uh, and I certainly encourage people to continue to, to add questions and I'll, I'll try to sort of aggregate in this way. But th there are actually two questions on measurement. Now I'll do them one at a time. Um, so you've mentioned that the, the J curve and essentially investment in intangibles isn't captured in, in GDP figures, but what about, um, um, changing measurement of GDP as it relates to consumers. So I, I've actually always found the idea of a productivity slowdown quite extraordinary when I think about my own life um, and the productivity with which I live it. I, I no longer wait for people for long periods of time because I can contact them with my my phone. The statistician does not capture that, that activity. Um, I no longer purchase paper maps. Um, but I have access to a map that the statistician is unaware that I have access to. Um, is it possible that GDP on the consumer side is also being undermeasured and that this is um, uh, part of the um, slowdown in measured productivity? Yeah, so that's a it's a great question. It's something actually I, I've written written about. Um, the and I went into studying that issue I, I, with a very open mind, um, but I ended up being convinced that the productivity slowdown is not a measurement issue of that sort, which I'll just summarize, but I, I know it's oversimplifying that a bunch of great new IT goods were creating basically massive value, but they were being given away for free or they weren't being sold anywhere near the value they were created for, so or that they were creating. And therefore, maybe surplus went up a lot, but uh, GDP didn't. And so uh, this is a paper uh, I wrote in the Journal of Economic Perspectives and other folks actually did work in parallel. That's all cited in there. You can read it. Also came to the same conclusion I did, but through different methods. There's just, while as the story is plausible when you actually press it with the data. It's it kind of doesn't work qualitatively and it really doesn't work quantitatively. So just for example, like if you think IT products are the source of mismeasurement or the worst source of mismeasurement, you would expect economies where IT is more important, either on the consumer side or the production side, would have a larger measured productivity slowdown because that again, is the source of the mismeasurement. But you don't see that at all. There's just no relationship between that. If you apply some numbers of like how much people value the internet, uh, access to the internet, to do the maps and all the, and contact people immediately, all the things you mentioned, um, and that is something people pay for. So we have some willingness to pay. You can extrapolate that. You, you can't, you can, the most generous assumptions will close a third of the gap that existed at least in 2016, I think is when the last I looked at the paper. So, or looked at the data. So, uh, and then there's there's other things to keep in mind or other reasons that the, the story doesn't seem to work when we, you press it with the data. It's just not big enough. Um, the, Eric Brynjolfsson, my co-author on the J-curve paper is trying to actually do work to try to measure these consumer side benefits that aren't in prices, which by the way, if you know national income accounting, GDP never has tried to measure consumer surpluses. Like by definition, it doesn't include it. It only includes the market price of things. But he's trying to basically say, let's get a welfare measure that accounts for some of this consumer surplus growth, but still 
I don't, it, it just doesn't seem large enough. And the story I like to always tell people is, hey, there was this product in the late 50s and early 60s. It just revolutionized people's home life. They spent three, four, five hours a day on average using this uh, uh, newfangled product. It totally changed their leisure time. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about television. Well, even though we weren't counting all those benefits and the revolutionary change in household activity and leisure, we still had productivity growth as twice what it was during the IT era. So that didn't slow down measured productivity growth then, uh, but nevertheless, we are suffering from a slowdown in measured productivity growth now. Well, thanks very much. Um, just continuing the, the the measurement theme, we've got a, a couple of questions on um, some of those differences between the US and New Zealand are really interesting and in whether the, the structure of the economy might play into it. Um, and th this actually goes back to something that, that we've been talking about in, in New Zealand on, on productivity. I've seen a few presentations on that. Um, I mean, productivity measured in terms of the number of widgets per hour that we, that we produce hasn't been great in New Zealand, but we have had a terms of trade boom. So our terms, so the, um, so we may be, you know, we got out of semiconductors, which is an incredibly, um, a, a, an industry that's had an amazing productivity improvement. We're in dairy production um, where productivity improvement has been less, but the price that the world pays us for these dairy products has gone up. Um, and therefore actually without widgets per hour productivity improvement, um, we've, we've sort of followed our nose to a, to a higher income dollars per person. Um, so just your perspectives on on that um, or or more generally the structure of the New Zealand economy versus the US economy and and what that what that's doing to productivity growth. Uh, so that's that's a great issue. I mean one thing in terms of just structure. So like everyone's moving more and more towards services, of course, which raises its own measurement issues, you know, what what's the output of a bank? You know, what is it? dollars of loans you make, the number of de depositors you have, if it's both, how do you combine them? What about if they sell insurance? What, I mean, services just in general are a tougher thing to measure. So as economies uh, are becoming more and more service intensive, we're going to have more and more measurement issues. So that's, that's just one thing going on in the background. I will say in terms of the terms of, in terms of, the terms of trade issue, um, I mean, it's great that the relative price of your exports is rising, that increases incomes, even if productivity doesn't change. But hey, if you could increase productivity on top of that, that means all the more increase in income. It doesn't, the, the terms of trade gain doesn't, I don't think create any inherent barrier to pro, further productivity growth, which would also, just like productivity growth always does, increase incomes. So, uh, in, I, I, it's it's a happy circumstance that terms of trade have gone in a way that have allowed some income convergence, but it doesn't decrease the amount of lost income that is uh, that that New Zealand suffers because it hasn't had relative productivity growth. That might be the way I'd say it. Brilliant. Thank you. So there's a couple of questions on productivity and sustainability. So, um, you know, is, is productivity growth um, consistent with sort of a sustainable world? Um, can we just continue to, to grow GDP or, or are there limits? Um, or are there sort of win-wins, for example, um, productivity enhancing supply chain decarbonization that might, might yep. benefit both, both sustainability and productivity? Yep. Uh, I, I don't think there is any... Um, inherent contradiction between productivity growth and sustainability. I mean, one way to interpret that ratio of outputs to inputs is a lot of people say same output, more input, but you could say same, or sorry, <laughs> same input, uh, inputs, more output, but you could also couch productivity growth as same output, fewer inputs. If you need less stuff to make what you get already, you're going to be using up less resources. So that's a, that's a good thing. Second of all, and I see this in the US, we're really struggling with it. Um, 
we, if you, in, in terms of the short run response to climate change, what we have to do here at least is change over to renewables very quickly. That involves a whole bunch of investments, physical investment. We got to build new power lines. We got to build solar plants. We have to put up windmills, et cetera, et cetera. All that activity has to be done and you want it to be done as efficiently as possible. So productivity it, uh, determines how many resources you use up to shift from fossil base, a fossil fuel based economy to a renewable based economy. So that's another way um, it matters. And just in general, I'll say the most of the, I think it's most of the OECD countries now have been seeing a decade, at least a couple decades uh, of GDP growth with a reduction in carbon intensity. So we've been able to get growth in GDP without using, um, certainly without using as much carbon per dollar. And I believe several of the economies uh, in terms of absolute amount of carbon emissions have, have been going down. So I think, you know, people think of, tend to think of economic growth as physical stuff, but a lot of economic growth just becomes You know, if we figure out how to uh, do medical care that increases people's longevity by five years or something, that's not necessarily going to use any more physical resources, but it's obviously of massive value. So you can get value in a lot of ways that don't involve use of physical resources. And then again, for the things that do, productivity growth means you need fewer physical resources to produce the same amount of output than you did before. Okay. Thank you. Um, so there, there are quite a few questions on um, public policy interventions most likely to improve productivity growth is sort of the most general articulation. Um, but yeah, quite a few people, I guess, looking for public policy solutions and um, specifically yeah, there's mention in the in the Q&A of New Zealand's smallness and remoteness. So we're a small open economy. Um, I know that the Productivity Commission a number of years ago, I was quite taken with um, with one of their own inquiries that basically found that that New Zealand's you know, productivity challenge is that it's small and remote. Um, remoteness means it's harder to diffuse new knowledge, um, less likely to have firms on the global scale less likely to find global competition arriving in New Zealand, which means poor management practices can be um, sustained. You know, companies are more likely to be able to get away with continuing with poor management practice. So um, in the context of a small, open, remote economy, what are the public, you know, what's your perspective on that? And, and what are the public policy, um, public policies we could pursue? That you would recommend to um, to overcome these challenges? Yeah, that's a great issue. I think you you highlight. I, I agree with the the Productivity Commission's analysis about the basic thrust of some of the structural issues um, that remoteness creates. I mean, the thing there is probably only so much you can do about trade costs. You you know if you've got reasonable openness in terms of legal structure if shipping stuff and people takes longer it takes longer and more energy that's just the way it is i would say i think and this goes back to that comment i made about the complementarity between product market competition and input markets you do have more direct scope over input market policy and i i won't admit to know a lot of details about either capital or labor markets in New Zealand, but you probably have more scope for affecting the efficiency of input markets than trade, say, in New Zealand. So I would take a look at that and ask, okay, are there thing are labor market markets acting the way we would want them to? Can workers move when they want to move? Um, can capital move when it should be moved? Does it move in the right direction? Do banks have the right incentives? Banks and any sort of financing entities, et cetera. So 
I would kind of focus maybe on the input market side of things there, regulatory to issues in general about just operational things. You balance the benefits of the regulation against, you know, potential productivity costs there. You know, Sir John Hicks said the greatest of all monopoly uh, the greatest of all monopoly profits is a quiet life. Uh, and if you're protected from competition, you don't have a lot of incentive to get better. But the, sort of the flip side of that is even a monopolist, if they can cut their costs, they'll make more money doing it. So you, maybe you just got the, you, you want some sort of mechanism that somehow lets those best practices sink in, even given the competitive structure. It's easier when it's a dog eat dog world out there. It, I know that, of course, but um, maybe there are things that can um, sort of get, be, you know, get be best practices to spread around, around more quickly, uh, industry associations and things like that. Thanks, Chad. I'm um, just picking up on that input market side. So there's one question. What, what's your perspective on active labour market policies, such as vocational training policies aimed at enhancing matching efficiency in terms of their impact on improving overall productivity? So I'm really big on matching efficiency. It, it, it comes out of this work I mentioned with my co-authors on the, this looking at job uh, firm to firm changes for workers in Chile. So we found the average transition is productivity enhancing. The a worker is going from a, a, a lower productivity company to a higher productivity company. If you just count them up though, it's only 53% of transactions have that gain. 47 is in the other direction. And we did a back of the envelope calculation. If you could just improve that 53 to say 55, something like that, you would have really big noticeable aggregate productivity gains coming just from what I would think is a modestly better matching process, getting workers to more productive companies. So I'm, I think there's, there's great potential in improving matches. Now, do I know what, you know, training programs, what labor, um, Department of Labor policies are the best to improve that uh, type of match. I'll admit I don't. So I, I can't give you the, here's the magic 10 step way to get there. But um, I can say it would be very fruitful uh, to come up with anything that improved the match. Even just marginally, it will probably have really large aggregate effects because again, things on balance are so close. What, one of the key issues for New Zealand um, on training workers is we have a very um, transient population. We have one of the highest um, uh, proportions of foreign born uh, people in the world and we have a massive diaspora of New Zealanders overseas. So we have we have a churn in our population that is that is far greater than um, uh, many other countries. I think it it could well be to do with um, being English speaking and um, just the opportunities available to, to people. Um, but what that does is uh, it does make it tricky that, you know, there's there are clear externalities to educating your population, but then if you publicly fund it, they um, you, you might train people and they might leave. So I just um, I don't know, the, the role of migration and the role of uh, an education policy in the context of migration. Do you have any any comments there on um, uh, uh, how that affects productivity? That's a great question. I The short answer is no, I don't. I haven't seen work on this that's really pinned down the numbers. It's so interesting to me though, because I come from a state in the US that basically served the function that you just mentioned, which is you, they educated a large number of their graduates in college and then a huge chunk of them left because that just weren't the jobs. Uh, and so, yeah, what do you do? <laughs> Hope they come back someday or send large uh, remittances or something like that. 
Um, yeah, that's a it's a great issue, but I'm afraid I I don't I'm not sure I have anything intelligent to to say about it. Yeah, I mean, presumably we do get we do get people people back, and presumably that international flow helps with the dispersion of ideas that you that you're talking about. Um, just I mean on um, public policy, just continuing the theme of policy recommendations. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the role of of regulation. And we've had one person point out that um, New Zealand does really well on a lot of objective measures of regulatory efficiency. We tend to get high scores. Um, uh, by memory, we were the highest for a while in ease of doing business. Um, yet it doesn't seem to convert to productivity growth. We seem to have lower GDP per capita despite these good policies. Um, um, do you have any, yeah, any comment on regulatory policy and particularly in the New Zealand context if, uh, if possible? So what I know from the research literature, it tends to be kind of industry specific. It's like you can point to, you know, it, it's almost like very process related, like they okay. It affects what the companies that are big emitters of this stuff do in response to that. You show how they use resources to reduce that, and that also changes productivity. Or you get these more perverse things where a regulation to do, you know, task A or to achieve outcome A actually creates incentives for, for producers to be really inefficient along some other dimension because now they're just chasing this A outcome instead. So I know a lot of that sort of the bigger picture regulatory stuff is beyond the entry and exit of businesses, which I, I think is important. I sort of view that as a, a similar to ma a similar manifestation to this input market flexibility I was talking about. So that that that's an important thing um i might say something we're dealing with in the us now is well there's a couple of things one is regulation effects can be really cumulative it's not like on the margin one more regulation is the straw that breaks the camel's back but if you keep adding them over time and you're not sort of minding how they interact, uh, each one might make sense by itself in isolation, but when you've added them all together, now you've got this uh, pile that creates a lot of um, problems for producers and maybe even is uh, uh, you know counterproductive in terms of achieving the, the aims of the regulation itself. So I. Thinking about the accumulation of it is useful. I, I, and I don't know if New Zealand is any worse or better on that dimension um, than than anywhere else. And the other issue that I've become especially aware of lately, Austin Goolsby and I just wrote a thing about how bad construction productivity growth is in the U.S. and really throughout the OECD. Um, there, it's a common. I, I don't. I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't lay it all at the feet of regulation, but there is a big policy element, which at least with construction, it opens up a massive number of veto points. There are a lot of entities who can stop things or stop things for a while while something is adjudicated either by a regulatory body or by the courts. And that's, that's causing a problem, by the way, with the shift to renewables, it's hard to get new transmission lines built the la we just approved a big transmission line that went up for approval initially 14 years ago. That's how long it took for, to approve one line. And sort of, there, it's hard to tell a story where any environmental goal requires that sort of level of scrutiny. It's almost surely this is just reflecting a bunch of entities who want to get their hand into the till while this giant project is is being considered, or you know, hand in the till figuratively, either in money they pull out or money they would lose if it were built. Um, so I think kind of a broader notion, it's not just 
it's not just regulation like this statute says you got to do this, but do you have an efficient system for achieving the goals of the regulation without a bunch of wasteful time wasteful and resource wasteful processes to achieve that? I, I, it's become more about like the process of regulation seems to be where the costs are as much as the actual rules that it imposes at least in the states it's a big problem yeah i think we've we've just had some um yeah we're reviewing the resource management act at the moment in in new zealand or um, um or replacing resource management act and there's there have been a few rule changes aimed at specifically um unblocking exactly that type of um activity um there are a couple of questions on the relationship really between the economic cycle and how that's affecting some of the things that you've measured. Um, there are two sort of ways into this. One is that um, an observation that during downturns there are often productivity spikes because the least productive workers are the ones who are who are laid off. So whether that was um, part of the reason that the the uh, we saw a, a spike in productivity during COVID. Um, the second. For, um, for me, it was around, you, you talked about the increase in um, in shuffling and um, uh, quit rates had gone up and were, were much higher than, than, than firings and that this was um, indication that productivity is sort of healthy at the moment. But as somebody involved in macro and forecasting, I, I would suggest that that's partly cycle. You know, the um, economies around the world were overheated, overstimulated by fiscal and monetary policy. Um, uh, we ha currently have really high inflation as a consequence. Economies are kind of overheating. Yes, they're in this this period of great strength where business dynamism is there. But I would argue that the journey to um, achieving stable inflation is going to involve a a commensurate downturn on the other side is certainly what we're forecasting in New Zealand. Tightening of monetary policy, a downturn in economic growth, and um, might that um, sort of lead to the inverse uh, over time? Which got me thinking a little bit about whether you're, whether you're suggesting that there's hysteresis in, in monetary policy, sort of um, long-term effects on the supply side. So, yeah, the um separation of cycle from trend in, in some of your analysis and and just secondly whether there's hysteresis in um in cycles on the, on the supply side sure great uh no argument with the cyclical stuff i mean um yes you typically see these spikes and returns around recessions composition effects labor hoarding effects etc um, sort of the big, you know, if I were to, well, the last few quarters haven't been so great, but yeah, my, my overall view just was all of that volatility around COVID was just that stuff. Okay. So what I really want to think about is like, let's, let's remove ourselves from 2022 a little bit. Unfortunately, I I can't get dynamism, year long dynamism stuff. But if you look at the dynamism for early 2023, it still looks like the 2022 numbers that went up there, uh, I put up there. Now, who's to say the cycle isn't a few years longer yet? And until inflation is vanquished, I think we have to consider your hypothesis that there's going to be a payback uh, necessary uh, for inflation to come down. We haven't seen that. We've seen in the U.S. at least a fair amount of uh, deflate, disinflation, sorry, um, without any slowdown in job growth. Uh, but again, it's it's early, and these are high frequency numbers that um, you know are noisy. So who knows? The hysteresis point. Oh, that's great. I mean, for, I think you've already got one hurdle of, geez, do does monetary policy even have any supply side effects at all? Because I think a lot of people just think it's all demand. I've been more convinced lately, no, there, there is a supply element to it. Whether it, you get 
it's actually involves hysteresis, I think is fascinating. I had, to be honest, I had thought of it until you mentioned it. Um, if so, I mean, that's amazing. You slow the, you, you change these unfavorable decade long um, uh, trends with, you know, a, a large enough uh, monetary stimulus that was that would speak to, I think, a power that no monetary policy economist or very few had considered before. Um, so that's one thing to keep an eye on, because I, I have no, to be honest, no easy story of why business formations went up 30 percent and haven't fallen since. Um, something's going on, but I don't know. I don't know why it's been so steady. But it, as I say, it, it has been, in, including for the first part of 2023. Brilliant. Okay, so that's um, I think that's a really interesting um, finish to the to the uh, to the session here. Sort of um, unanswered questions around how the cycle is going to play out, whether the yeah the subsequent disinflation period is going to. I'll be really fascinated to see whether it reverses some of your charts or not, and um, uh, whether the the optimistic picture that you've that you've painted in recent years is is cycle or trend that, that'll be fascinating and it sounds like there are unanswered questions for us to to come back to in time so um yeah i'll just take the take the chance to say thank you very much chad for for taking the time to share your insights and experience with us um and thanks everybody who's who's been out online um there were so many questions i didn't didn't do them verbatim but i hope that the q a session i think um yeah really elucidated some 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 further points um so our next uh seminar in the productivity in a changing world theme will take place on Tuesday 20th of June. We'll have uh, Jonathan Pinsk, uh, Professor of Strategy, Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Manchester and um, theme lead of Social, Environmental and Technological Transitions of the Productivity Institute. So I um, invite you to, to join us then and really looking forward to that one too. But um, but for now, let me say thank you one more time to, to Chad for a, a really fascinating presentation um, and I'd like to thanks Chad um, I'd like to close with a whakatoki um, a Māori proverb that talks about uh, discussion learning understanding and knowledge underpinning the well-being of all people mā te kōrero ka mōhio mā te mōhio ka mārama mā te mārama ka mātou mā te mātou ka ora te iwi Thanks once again, Chad, and thanks to everybody for participating today. Uh, Matewa.